Welcome to episode four of the Inside Nutley podcast. I'm your host, Tom Greco, and I'm pleased to be joined by Nutley Commissioner of Revenue and Finance, Thomas J. Evans. Welcome, Commissioner. Hi, Tom. Great to be here. Commissioner, we'd like to start off by having you tell our viewers and listeners who may not be familiar with you a little bit about yourself. Well, many people I don't think realize that I actually was born in Nutley. Um, my mom and dad happened to move into Nutley on January 31st, 1955. And my twin brother and I were born on the morning of February 1st, 1955. So we made it by hours uh, to be considered a, a true Nutleyite. Uh, I'm, I did go to uh, Nutley High School, uh, St. Mary's Grammar School uh, prior to that, uh, and then on to college where I graduated from Fairleigh Dickinson uh, with a degree in business. What's it like growing up with a twin? Uh, it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, we, we've had fun together. Uh, you know, early memories would be trying uh, to watch my dad struggle to figure out who was Tom, who was Ted, and he never got it right, right? Uh, and so we just had a lot of fun with that. Uh, never, We never could uh, you know, switch up on girlfriends and things like that, right? uh, but we were able to have some fun and switch classrooms in school. Uh, so you know, we've had some fun. Tell me a little bit about your childhood growing up in Nutley. What were, what were some of the things that, that a lot of us that had, did grow up in Nutley uh, we have a lot in common, obviously, but tell us a little bit about your experience. Uh, well, my uh, my early days uh, at at St. Mary's were yeah, I was an altar boy. Yeah, many many were uh, as a, my brother and I because we were identical twins. We were in high demand for weddings uh, and, and things like that. So, so we got a, we got a sense of that. But it was normal uh, growing up. You know, uh, every day uh, in the summertime, it was. You were either going to play football, baseball, or basketball, uh, and it, you uh, generally, because of the environment, uh, you were with your neighborhood friends. Uh, so every day uh, was was fun. Uh, I remember, you know, early memories uh, of of Nutley growing growing up is uh, my dad never locked the front door. Right uh, in the summertime, you know, we would go to sleep and the front door would be open because we had a fan. We didn't have air conditioning. But the doors, the front door and the back door were wide open and everybody went to sleep and never, never gave, gave it a thought. So, so the, the idea of, of knowing that I was growing up in a safe town, right, uh, strong family values. Uh, my mom and dad are from Pennsylvania uh, originally, but uh, strong family roots, uh, uh, being around the house, Sunday dinners, uh, always being uh, the same, uh, importance of being, being around. Uh, being around to help. Uh, and uh, when uh, there was a time of need and a time of crisis, you know, we learned at a very, very early age uh, that you help people. Um, always had an experience uh, with my dad and mom, uh, especially is, is that uh, uh, there's a value structure, you know, you know value of your word, uh, value of always being uh, respectful. Uh, and always representing your family so that you never do harm to your family name. Uh, I think, you know, that's what I remember growing up being taught. Uh, and uh, as you said, Tom, I think in Nutley, uh, my, I don't think my experience was unique. I think it was very common. Speaking of your dad, I, I you know, your dad, I think, was a very popular figure in town. We, I, I know personally, I, I didn't know you, but I knew your dad. I mean, we'd, we'd always be, when we went to the Little League field or whatever and walk past the house, he'd always be out front with the cigar and he'd stop and talk and, and anything yep. you did, dad was, was well, you know, personally for me, uh, was a great guy. And it was just, it was always fun to run into him. Absolutely. Uh, he always had a story. He was always willing to help. Um, yeah, we, uh, money back then, money was tight at home. Uh, but I think it was tight for a lot of people uh, at home at the time. But if uh, if my dad had a dollar in his pocket and you needed the dollar, my dad my dad reached for that dollar and gave you that dollar. Uh, Hancock's Realty uh, in Nutley is a small you know, real estate practice that my mom and dad established. And uh, I remember uh, my dad worked on selling a house. Uh, my mom and dad both did that. And the people were struggling to get in it and they were getting married. So not only did my dad sell the house, he gave his commission as a wedding gift 
and my mom and dad were the witnesses at their wedding. Wow. You know, so there's a, that's the environment in which I was raised is that you, um, you know, and I've often said this, you know, you're always willing to help, willing to give, give help to those that need, but it wasn't about you, it was about them. So, you know, you were first to step forward to help, but quick to step back because it wasn't about you. And I learned that from a very early age. For those who don't know, your dad was Stanley Evans. We, we yes. Didn't... yes, yes. Stash Stanley, Stanley K, right? My mom, to my mom, Kenny. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Stanley Evans, yes. Tell us a little bit about your career. Um, I uh, was fortunate to go to, as I mentioned earlier, to uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University. Uh, my brother and I worked our way through college. Uh, at that time, I graduated uh, with a business degree with a concentration in accounting. And early in my career, I uh, started a career in professional accounting uh, with the firm of, of, of Coopers and Librand, uh, one of the big eight uh, firms back in uh, 1977. Uh, I was fortunate enough that uh, uh, after my internship, I was hired uh, and I began a long career with Coopers and Librand, uh, and then the merger with between Coopers and Librand and Price Waterhouse to create Price Waterhouse Coopers. Uh, I became a partner, uh, and uh, after 38 years, I retired uh, in uh, uh, June of 2015, uh, meeting the mandatory retirement age. Uh, in my career, I worked uh, with uh, a diversified set of clients, both large public, Fortune 100, uh, Fortune 500 and small clients. Uh, and then later in my career, uh, I was able to couple my passion, which not only is for finance as a CPA, but also in education. And I became the uh, chief learning officer for the firm, uh, uh, overseeing uh, and having the duties as base, basically being the president of PwC University for North and South America. Oh, that's pretty impressive. When and why did you decide to run for public office? Um, I was received a phone call uh, from Carmen Arecchio. Uh At the time, uh, the sitting board of, of commissioners was going to have a change in that uh, 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 Commissioner uh, Gary Finari was stepping down uh, and was going to become a superior court judge, which created a vacancy in the uh, revenue and finance area. Uh, so he encouraged me to consider uh, stepping in to fill the unexpired term of, uh, of Commissioner Finari, uh, which I did uh, with the full backing of the board. Uh, once appointed, I had a, uh, I was on the November, I was appointed in June and then in, in 2003, I had to sit on the uh, ballot for November of 2003 and then run for actual election in May of 2004 for a four year term. Uh, the decision around all of that, uh, I think is rooted more in my upbringing as well as my professional career. Um, in my professional career, I've always believed that there is nobility in being uh, in public service and being of service to others. And I felt that uh, sitting in this seat and being able to be the revenue finance commissioner was a natural extension of my my core beliefs. Was your dad alive when you were first elected? No, unfortunately, he passed in 1988. Uh, but I'm sure he would have been all around town. Yeah, yeah. Thank you say yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who know, knew my dad would know that he would be uh, at uh, you know at the top of his game all around town. That's for sure. Get, handing out cigars. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. As Commissioner of Revenue and Finance, all the town's funds run through your department. That has to be an all-encompassing job. How were you able to do that and maintain a separate full-time career? I think uh, when I think about that for a moment, uh, I you've heard the concept of a 24-7 schedule. Right? I think you just have to figure out a way to integrate and create balance by as, creating as much flexibility as uh, possible. Uh, I uh, not only uh, did I do that with my professional career and the town, 
uh, I also was a single parent. Um, my wife, had uh, Yolanda uh, Parada Evans, uh, had passed away in 2000. So um, the idea of, of being a single parent, managing my career, uh, when I look back on it, definitely you know, flexing 24 seven, uh, generally uh, 85 hours a week uh, to do that uh, and making a commitment. But, you know, I think anybody who thinks about their, whatever they do, no matter what it is, you have to make a commitment to that and you have to have the determination and the conviction to live up to that decision. And I think once you step into that role, uh, I wouldn't say it's easy, but you, you just happen to just make the decisions and commit the time and get things done. Sometimes I look back and didn't understand how I got it done, but I was, I was able to get it done. Like any governmental leadership role, um, it, there's a lot more negative that comes with than the positive with regard to the response from the public. I, I, is it worth it? I wouldn't be here if it wasn't. I'm, I've been sitting in my seat now uh, for 20 years. Uh, at the end of the term, it'll be 22 years. Uh, I have never regretted a moment of it. Uh, um, and I think uh, in part is because, you know, yes, uh, I'm a CPA. Uh, I, I look at the financial side. I have a passion for education. But I don't think uh, myself, I don't think any of my commissioners e either sit in their seats with a view that says, oh, I take care of the parks or I take care of the police or I take care of the roads or I have the veterans affairs that I, I concentrate on or me, I concentrate just on, on the finances. I think every uh, day you sit in this seat with a passion to understand that our responsibility is to never lose sight of the fact that uh, we need to provide for the health, welfare, and safety of the community. And underneath that is, is making sure that Nutley is a wonderful place to live and a wonderful place to raise a family. And we make decisions that are grounded in that. And I think being a commission form of government and being a nonpartisan form of government allows us to place a premium on that thinking. But doesn't love come into it a lot too? The fact that you love the town? I mean, I, again, talking to all the commissioners, the amount of time you all put in uh, that most people don't understand or realize, I, I think you couldn't do it if you didn't love the town. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I thought in my answer that maybe that would come out, but yeah, absolutely. You have to have a passion and love for the town. I, I you know, I'm the tax uh, commissioner. I have to send out the tax bills. I know that they go to everybody in town, uh, but every one of the people in town, the ones that I know and the ones I don't know, you have to care about uh, and never lose sight of that. The other four departments in town are for the most part self-explanatory. But revenue and finance covers a wide scope. Can you give us an overview of your department's responsibilities? Sure, sure. Um, I would I would say that that the revenue and finance department is uh, of all of the part departments is a hub function, the central service hub function. Uh, in my department, I have the uh, municipal clerk's office, which uh, is the gateway of communication to the public. Uh, obviously, the commissioners communicate directly, but but uh, if people need information, generally they will go to the municipal clerk's office. So for things such as uh, 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 permits for certain things, dog licensing for, for things, information about the town, you go to that office. I also have the responsibility for water and tax collection and billing. Uh, so that, that circulates from uh, my cashier's function as well as my tax collector. Uh, the uh, I, as in addition is the uh, tax assessing function, uh, which uh, ensures that there's fairness and, and equity in the distribution of, of, of our taxes. Behind that is the entire treasury function, uh, compliance with, uh, with many state statutes that govern how a local government operates, as well as making sure we're doing our best from the standpoint of purchasing to get the best pricing on, on the materials that we need. And then in addition to that is the construction office, zoning and, uh, and code enforcement. 
Um, so uh, if, if anyone needs to uh, do work on their home, uh, they will need to stop by the construction office to find out what the permit requirements are, what the construction code requirements are, and where that office is there to help people uh, to make sure that they get that right. So uh, I would say, again, I think it's a hub function with a lot of specialized services. The issue that must come up for you more than any other is taxes. Before we get into some specifics, can you explain how our property taxes are tabulated? Sure. Um, your tax bill uh, that everybody receives has three, three major components. There's the municipal share of the tax, the school share of the tax, as well as the county share of the tax. The municipal portion, which is governed by the five uh, members of the board of commissioners, covers the five municipal, municipal departments. Uh, the school board has a responsibility for ensuring that uh, they're meeting the expectations of what the educational requirements are for our children and what the financial funding requirements are associated with that. And being part of Essex County, we share in what the overall county uh, uh, responsibilities are, but that's spread out uh, across the municipalities within uh, Essex County. So uh, it goes through uh, very specific standards of compliance in order to generate that bill. And once that bill is, is generated, it's certified by the Essex County T uh, Board of Taxation, which then enables us to release the tax bills uh, generally in the July, August timeframe. With that big pie made up of all those factors, our actual township taxes, including all of our services, really only take up about 34% of our total bill. Is that correct? Yes, about the 34% of that. Uh, of the property tax bill is really the municipal department. So every everything that goes on through the Department of Public Works, everything that Commissioner Tucci is able to do to deliver that value is included. Everything that Commissioner uh, and Mayor Scarpelli is able to do through DPW. So our roads, our sewers, our streets, whatever is covered in that bill. Uh, in, my, in the administrative function, uh, that is primarily in my area, as well as what uh, Commissioner Kelly does with public affairs is in the bill. And, and the last part of that is the public safety portion, which you can imagine is, is the, the largest portion uh, of, of that bill. But all in all, yes, uh, roughly 34 cents on the dollar provides all of the municipal services that we have. You can't have the great parks and the, the you know, our, our snow, the snow plowed and and everything about this town that we love, uh, the great safety that we have, um, you can't have that and expect those taxes to stay stagnant. Um, or to, again, when you figure in that it's still only 35% of that total number, um, why is that so hard? Why is that message so hard to get to residents? Because I think when you add up the total tax bill, people aren't looking at the, the component parts. They're looking at the overall bill, right? And uh, and believe me, uh, uh, when we look at what we have to do in order to meet the operating cost structure of the town, uh, we we always are focused in on affordability and trying to do our best to get that message out. Uh, but when you look at the when you look at the bill, I think you know taxes aren't aren't, aren't low in that. We're not the we're not the highest in Essex County, but we're not the lowest in Essex, Essex County. Uh, and uh, and I think when you then look at the fact that that total tax bill is for many is is a significant share uh, of their annual spending ability, right? I, I I don't think people want to basically say, well, this part is okay, this part is 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 not. I think they look to to uh, to us as commissioners to do everything we can to justify that what we're asking them to contribute is fair and equitable, and, and we do our best to make it affordable. But Commissioner, you certainly don't get 35% of the blame, do you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're, yes, Tom. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. That was kind of my point that that uh, you know it, again, especially in the age of social media, uh, uh, the five of you are are are, are constantly are constantly going around with targets on your back, and uh, I think sometimes that's done without the uh, 
without considering the big picture and uh, to think that our taxes, which like you said, aren't low by any means, but we get a lot for what we pay for and considering what we're getting for what we pay for, um, I, I don't necessarily think the criticism is 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 uh, deserved. I think when people get get beyond that initial question around my taxes are high and they really then take the time to understand what services are provided, the response times that you have in not only no matter what it is, uh, and when you walk into any department, uh, the uh, services that you have that are available five days a week, you know, for people to to utilize them. Um, I think they understand that the the, that the underlying value uh, of what's associated with those taxes. Um, there's another element too that when you look at the total totality of, of our bill, um, and you look at the community itself, and you look at how the equity value of property has increased, you know, steadily. You know, uh, some of it has been obviously interest rate driven. Uh, but the value of Nutley, the demand for Nutley homes remains high. Uh, so they're, they're at one level, uh, while the operating value, it might be a little bit higher, the equity value continues to be there. And we as a board are sensitive to that. Over the last couple of years, the value of our homes has gone up 20%, correct? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, significant growth. Uh, in property uh, value, uh, which I hope is sustainable, you know, given given the current environment. Uh, but yes, what contributes to that is is all of the factors that go into making Nutley a great place to live. And that's my earlier comment. I think as as a governing body, we can't lose sight of the fact that we need to make decisions that continue to invest in the future of the town uh, and making sure that we continue to be that great place to live and to raise a family. What goes into preparing the township budget? Uh, a lot of crying. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Um, we, uh, every year uh, before the budget season starts, we sit down and we create a draft forecast of what we, we think the coming year is going to be. So uh, for, the, for 2023, we've already begun to look at what uh, the nature of the cost increases might be. So we can begin to prepare how we're going to you know, manage that uh, for, for, for the taxpayers. Um, like any, any household, any business, we have the same issues with rising costs. Uh, rising utility costs, rising gas prices, the rising uh, actual, actual rising cost of sewer uh, uh, charges, for example, uh, insurance, medical insurance, you know, all of those things are, are costs that we have to face every year and do our best to manage our, our way through that. Last selection was unique in that we were just hit by COVID. What kind of challenges did that present to your department specifically? Well, um, first was the you know, uh, the overall safety of all of my 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 staff, and figuring out how we can continue to be available to uh, the public to provide services, uh, uh, reaching out and with a coordinated effort with uh, Commissioner Tucci, ensuring that. You know, uh, plexiglass barriers were installed quickly, uh, making sure that uh, we can provide and have contact with the public and do that in a safe manner. So temperature readers at the entrance to, to the buildings were there having hand sanitizer, uh, following the rules for separation, you know, six feet of separation. We were able to get all of that in place and, and by and large, continue to operate and provide our services. So. Yeah, one of the things I'm I'm very uh, happy about is that we were able to continue to provide all of our services to the public without disruption because of the actions that we were able to take. And you were doing that personally while you were faced with your own health issues, correct? Yes, yes. I um, interestingly enough, in March of 2020, you know, when they first came out and said, "Hey, 
COVID is a big thing. Social distance, be be protected. Three days later, I got COVID uh, and uh, wound up uh, being at home uh, for for pretty much a month. In addition to uh, to COVID, uh, I think everybody faces uh, challenges in their in their life. Um, my uh, I faced the loss of my wife in 2000 from uh, breast uh, the, the breast cancer. Um, um, raised my children uh, you know, and did what I had to do. Um, but to my surprise, in 2016, I was also diagnosed with a blood-based form of cancer, uh, which I was very fortunate that I was able to work my way through that. Uh, and, um, and, today, and I remain very healthy uh, today. Uh, it is something that I have to always uh, take care of. But I think in life, we all have things that we have to do, whether it's uh, some form of cancer you have to face, face some form of heart disease, diabetes, or whatever. You know, I, I don't think uh, many of us get through this life without having to face a health crisis in some form. Uh, so, yes. So, in addition to uh, COVID, uh, I dealt with cancer, and after I finished COVID, I also got shingles. Uh, <laughs> So <laughs> it's, and then right after shingles, I was helping my daughter in her yard and I got poison ivy. <laughs> so it's, so, yeah, so it's just, so if you see me out there wearing a mask, it's because I think I'm a magnet for you know, whatever it seems to be out there. Uh, but yes, yeah, you know, I've, I've had to face a health crisis. Um, and I think uh, having, uh, my family around me, having friends around me, having the support of the commissioners while I was going through that and having my faith, I feel very, very fortunate today. You've held office for almost 20 years. What are you most proud of in your role as commissioner? Um, well, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I actually think that if I, if I actually go back and look at the records, I am the longest sitting revenue and finance commissioner in town. Uh, and, and, Part of that, I think uh, I'm, I'm proud of that because of, uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, the, the compassion, the empathy, uh, and the conviction that I have to serve uh, openly and honestly the residents of the town. You have to care about it. Uh, I think that's one. Um, when I look at you know, some of the events that occurred, one of the uh, most critical that I faced was the uh, abrupt announcement of the closure of the Hoffman Hoff Rose site. And uh, the risk uh, in my role was that we were going to lose a very significant uh, source of revenue because Hoffman LaRoche was our largest uh, taxpayer. And with the closing, uh, closing of their site, uh, we were uh, projecting the risk of losing almost $10 million of tax revenue overnight. Uh, so being able to uh, go to this state, work with uh, Essex County Executive Joe T. Finzenzo, as well as our state assemblyman, uh, Ralph Caputo, and gaining access in uh, Trenton to the right people, including being able to sit directly with, at the time with Governor Christie and his staff about uh, the issues with, with, with what was going on with Nutley and that what was happening with the divestiture of, of a large commercial ent enterprise that was exiting the state of New Jersey and that the taxpayers of Nutley shouldn't bear the burden of that. Right? We were able to have great conversation about that and actually which led to a modification of the, of the definition of what would be includable as what the state called transitional state aid uh, that we were, it became eligible for. And so during the time we needed that, uh, the township benefited by receiving accumulatively $28 million of, of revenue from the state, additional aid from the state to help mitigate uh, and soften the landing of that, which did a couple of things. It prevented the board from having to take a crisis short-term view of the decisions that we have to make on the Hop and the Rose site, and which is now on three. We've been able to take that longer term view, which has enabled us to see wonderful commercial rateables can, uh, occupy the buildings. We have a medical school. We have a life science orientation to, to that site. And so being able to take that, that 
financial crisis risk off the table. I'm very proud of the fact that uh, that I was able to do that with the support of, obviously, with the support of my commissioners. Um, and I say I'm proud of that with their support. And I would think, and, and, and my I know my other commissioners would do that. Whatever we accomplish as commissioners, you know, you have a lead responsibility, but you don't do it alone. You have support. So the unified support of the board to enable us to go uh, and do that, I think, uh, helped me push harder when I thought we wouldn't get the aid and to come up with a way to do that, which now has been converted into a permanent aid annually of an additional $2.6 million. So crisis averted. Uh, another piece of uh, real estate that that's coming up quite often is is the Ciccolini property. What are your thoughts on that and, and moving forward with that? Uh, you know, Tom, when I think about the Ciccolini uh, property, uh, I first think about uh, the value that Nutley had uh, with having the, the, the Ciccolini family, you know, having a furniture store in Nutley, um, not only from the fact that you could get good quality furniture there. Uh, what no one uh, knew about uh, is the philanthropy that would go through that uh, through that family in, in benefiting the town. So if someone in, went in there and there was a need, you know, uh, Bob Ciccolini didn't worry about, you know, if it was urgent and a need, whether or not he was going to get paid for it. He was more concerned about, you know, did he serve the need, uh, and he would deliver it and install it. So it was not just sell it, he would deliver it and install. So I think you know, from uh, when you think about the, the character of the town, uh, continuing that legacy uh, would be important, which I think we do. There's a great sense of volunteerism in the town. When it now comes to the, the future and the next generation of what the Ciccolini property becomes, um, I think the town is evolving. Uh, we're not a town of baby boomers. Or anymore, uh, there's new generations that are coming. There's different housing needs, that different housing expectations that we will face, and we have to, as a community, remain relevant. Uh, uh, the development uh, uh, that's going on today is mixed-use uh, development. But I think what's important is about is not the fact that it's mixed-use. It's the fact that it's how are we going to ensure that it's a design and the character of it is relevant to the town, it fits with the town, and that we're able to preserve things that are very valuable to the, vi the vitality of our business district, such as preserving public parking and increasing the availability of public parking, uh, providing open green space uh, that will be associated with it to actually you know, advance the town uh, in, uh, with a different, you know, in effect, a different type of brand for what the business district could look like. So uh, I think the plan, uh, the, the actual zoning and the elements of that will be uh, released by the Board of Commissioners uh, 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 soon. Uh, and I think the town uh, will have an opportunity to take a look at all of the, you know, the thinking that has gone into, into it. I think people are afraid that that's going to get beat uh, put into place before they have a say? The plan uh, is simply a plan that uh, sets the zoning for the area. The area uh, has been already declared uh, a while ago in terms of an area of, uh, of need of redevelopment uh, for the, the township owned property uh, and an area of rehab for the uh, privately owned property that's in that area between roughly between Breland and High Street on the west side. Um, so that that was done already. The next step is simply the plan, uh, and and what would we allow uh, to be in, in that space, uh, and what the character of that of what we would expect that to look like would be in that space. And that's where we are, uh, as far as uh, a redeveloper and what a redeveloper has plans to do. We are. Uh, in the very early stages of this, and that's still yet to come. Um, and there will also be site plan approval. And all of that, when we look at those plans and we look at what we're going to do, we'll have uh, public comment and public in input. Uh, uh, we're very sensitive to the need that people understand what this is. 
and what it could become. And we respect their views. What's your take on our overcrowded schools and our trailers? For years, uh, the, the, there's been a finger pointed at uh, the, the fact that we have apartments and that the apartments are, the new apartments are adding children to our school system. And I think if you take a hard look at what the apartments actually contribute uh, and the study that the Rutgers does independently of what uh, apartments do to contribute to the school system, you'll find that it's, it's a nominal factor in, in understanding what the issue is with, with our, our, our school. When I graduated in 1978, we had 500 kids in our class. How can we possibly have our schools overcrowded when there's less than 400 today? Most people would be surprised to learn that actually uh, since 2018, overall enrollment in our school has actually been going down. Right, so we're not adding more students. The reality is we are using space differently. The decisions, good decisions that have been made uh, and how we deal with uh, children of special need. So we have a classroom that was built in the early 20th century that was designed for the Industrial Revolution that didn't have any consideration of what a special needs child needed in space is occupying a classroom uh, with four students, eight students, 10 students in a classroom that historically held 35 to 40 students, right? Which we would not want uh, to have today. Early to mid 20th century infrastructure will not meet the needs of a 21st century education. So we will need to face uh, the decisioning around how we expand our school infrastructure in order to eliminate the, the use of trailers. Are you ready for a question from residents? Sure. All right. This is from David Wilson, who lives on Nutley Avenue. When is the property revaluation program being completed and the results applied? All of the inspections, property inspections, both the residential and commercial, have been completed already. Uh, I would expect that the uh, what they call the valuation letters that will be uh, issued from appraisal systems, which is the independent company will be doing that. I think residents should uh, expect to see them in sometime in the November, early December timeframe, uh, uh, which will be their first look. There will then be, be meetings uh, where people can come and discuss the valuation of their property, but ultimately the uh, full valuation will uh, be included in the property tax bills that are released uh, next July. So for the 2023 tax year. Okay, next question from David. How many property owners are in arrears on their property taxes? Um, specifically, I won't talk about any individual property, uh, but uh, very few. Uh, we just completed our uh, our annual, which, which is called the tax sale. Uh, and uh, from a property tax perspective, there was only nine properties in Nutley that were part of that sale. All right, last question. Will you increase minimum lot sizes to prevent knockdowns and subdivisions that are leading to overdevelopment, overcrowding, and loss of historical buildings and residential zones in Nutley? Um, the uh, decision around uh, increasing lot size or changing the zoning requirements uh, is, a, is a question that would be before the planning board as part of the master plan review process. The timing for that is a very, is a very good because the master plan review is actually underway uh, to now. It's, it's reviewed every, every 10 years. Uh, so uh, that's a process that would go before that board. I think residents that have a concern should uh, advance those concerns before the planning board. If the planning board looks at that and makes that determination or recommendation, uh, that recommendation will be presented to the board of commissioners and we will address it at that time. Commissioner, thank you for your time. You're welcome, Tom, I enjoyed this. And I'd, uh, it, I'd be uh, open if you were willing to invite me back, be willing to take on uh, more questions from residents and any anything else that's on your mind at any time. Thank you so much, it's been great. All right, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. 